Welcome to the Cross Knowledge Podcast. Here we discuss the trends, opportunities, and challenges of corporate digital learning. Let's meet today's host. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cross Knowledge Podcast. I'm Renan, and I'll be your host today. The Human Advantage is a series of the Cross Knowledge Podcast where we explore the pivotal role of humans in driving organizational success. The idea is to hold candid conversations with business leaders and experts who have demonstrated a deep commitment to fostering a more human workplace. Today, we're excited to welcome Carolyn von der Mosel. Carolyn is a trailblazer in transforming how companies approach talent development. In her previous job, she did something fantastic. She pioneered a groundbreaking early careers program that redefined outdated talent evaluation methods emphasizing learning agility over fixed performance metrics. But that's not all. She's also the author of Untagged and hosts a podcast of the same name. Both her book and podcast challenge traditional HR practices and advocate for a more human-centered approach to talent management. In this episode, we'll explore innovative strategies to revolutionize employee development, moving beyond traditional HR practices and embracing personalized approaches that foster growth and engagement. Carolyn, welcome and thank you for joining us today on the Cross Knowledge Podcast. Thank you, Renan. It's a, it's a pleasure to hear, be here. Thanks for, for inviting me. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Well, Carolyn, uh, so you wrote a book called, and you, the title of your book is Untagged. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book and what inspired you to write this book? Sure, with uh, with a lot of pleasure. Um, Untagged is um, deeply rooted in my in my personal journey. Um, so really early on in my career, um, I noticed that what was was holding me back um, professionally and personally were labels in the workplace. Um, and just to give you some examples of what I mean by labels, so those were kind of labels as um, as job titles. So for example, my job title of being a junior HR business partner or uh, the outcome of psychometrics. So, for example, being labeled as as an introvert, um, that was out kind of, yeah, consciously being able to 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 name it as a label, but that was something that was holding me back. And I only noticed that a lot of the HR practices were actually connected to that when I kind of um, advanced in my in my HR role. Um, so I really noticed that, yeah, basically in a lot of processes um, in all stages of the employee life cycle. So from recruitment, where we um, use a lot of labels specifically now with AI also to kind of recruit people um, over to performance development where we put like performance labels on people. So for, on a scale from one to five, for example, um, talent reviews where we box people into boxes based on yeah uh, their potential and their performance. It's all about kind of labeling people. And um, yeah, that um, together with my personal experience, I just kind of, yeah, went on a journey to discover how useful those labels are um specifically in the in a world that is um very volatile and very um yeah changing very very quickly um just to explore like for organizations and for individuals how how useful is it to put labels on people and what alternatives do we have yeah that's very very interesting and i really like what you said because actually it goes along with uh, with the idea well the world is so volatile at the moment So how can we tag someone in a volatile world? I really like that questioning. Um, So how have the concepts and ideas from your book influenced your approach to L&D? Yeah, so basically what I'm explaining in the book is that I kind of really go back to what labels are. So what characteristics do, do, do labels have? And anyone who's done an unconscious bias training knows that we kind of, we need labels or kind of, essential to to survive so if we see you see someone across the street that you don't know whether to trust that person yes or no then um you kind of actually have to label that person based on what you've learned in the past about people who have maybe similar physical um aspects of that person that you're seeing um so you kind of really have to go back to what you learned in the past um it is always one directional so that is another characteristic of labels that it's kind of you actually don't have time to get into interaction with that person. It's one directional. And then it's also always based on shortcuts. So for example, that person, I don't know, having a tattoo or wearing a specific jacket. And so that those are kind of the characteristics of labels. As, as I said, like it's, it's in many situations, it is um, 
it is essential just to, to survive and just to make quick decisions. Um, so like if you think of um, the fact that you essentially receive um, 20 million bits of information per second and uh, you're consciously only aware of 40 to 50 um, of, of these bits of information, the decisions you take are always biased. So that is something that um, that kind of, yeah, you can't really kind of question. Uh, and that is also happening in the in the HR field. So like specifically when it comes to recruitment, when it comes to performance decisions, I think that's something that is just human and that is kind of al almost inevitable to, to to be biased to, to, a, certain, to, to a certain degree. Um, you can be more or less conscious about it. You can do co unconscious bias trainings. But what I'm explaining in the book is essentially the fact that a lot of HR practices um, kind of they deliberately use those labels and exactly the same characteristics um, and just to be more strategic or more data driven. And um, essentially those three characteristics of labels being path based, being word based um, and being done to you and being like one directional is something that um, has significantly shaped how I view uh, learning and development nowadays. Uh, so let us l start with the first one, um, something being done to you or one directional. I think that is really a big one, specifically when it comes to creating learning content, right? So, um, yeah, sometimes it's assumed that the more you create, the better and that you just put it out there. Uh, but without like actually asking the population, asking the employees, what, is, what do you need? What is it that you actually want to dive into? How helpful is it? Which learning formats do you um, do you prefer? Um, and so that is kind of similar to imagine at Christmas being handed a pair of ugly socks and you kind of, it's still a gift and you maybe to be polite, you put the socks on, but how useful is it um, for the individual? Like if you don't like it, if you don't use it. Um, and, and I think the perception of a lot of L&D departments is, yeah, but we're still creating content. It is still a gift to people. Well, it's, it's not. Um, and so that was really my, my first learning and the first connection from, from what I've learned in the book to um, how I approach learning and development. So like it's not, yeah, it's, it's not creating content for the sake of creating content, but really looking at formats that, formats that serve people and also content that really kind of um, make, make them advance in, in their careers and in their jobs. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because actually it's really about personalizing the learning experience to the individual to that person who's going to learn, right? Exactly. It's it's all around that. And also I'm a firm believer of the fact that we only learn in a sustainable kind of way if we're really connected to the topic, if we're really see something that is connected to our purpose, if we see something that we're kind of personally invested in. Um, and if not, kind of it's, the learning experience will be maybe you will kind of short memory remember something but it will not something it will not be a long lasting learning um learning experience so it's all about kind of really figuring out what people need on their journey to um yeah to advance and learn um and so like yeah connecting that to to their purpose like essentially kind of what is your learning purpose and then kind of how can we kind of on the way whenever you get to a challenge how can we provide the right resources for you to get there versus we throw out resources and we want you to consume them. So it's all about personalized learning experience for me is all about that, right? Or about kind of, we kind of challenge, you have a learning purpose, um, you want to get somewhere and we kind of assist you on the way to get there versus um, throwing content at you. And so that was, uh, yeah, my first, um, the first uh, way of how I look at uh, learning and development differently based on uh, yeah, on, on, on my research from, from the book. Um, the second one is essentially around um, the fact that I, I kind of explained it earlier when I talked about labels in the unconscious bias field, um, that labels are often or almost always based on what we've learned in the past. And I think that is the second biggest challenge for, for learning and development, that oftentimes we kind of just assume that the skills that were helpful in the past will be helpful in the future. Um, so we have like a, maybe a, a skill catalog that we use all, over and over and over again. And that is simply, simply not working. Um, this, yeah, due to the fact that companies are changing, challenges are changing, um, and, and also like personal needs are changing. Um, and so that is kind of the second biggest, biggest learning for, for learning and development that it's all around analyzing the skills that are within your current job also needed in the in the near future uh, and that can 
yeah, be done in, in two ways. It is either kind of asking the employee, so what what is it that you that is challenging right now based on kind of the new objectives or the new um, the new challenges that you're facing, but it could also be the company kind of doing an anal analysis and seeing like what is what is needed, what are the new skills that are actually needed to get to where we want to go or that are actually connected to the top challenges that we're having in the company. Um, so that being the second one and the third one, uh, again, linked to, to the characteristics of labels. Um, so labels being um, word-based or being shortcut-based. And so like within the book and within the uh, HR practices, I really connected to, um, to the fact that oftentimes HR practices are really kind of based on outcome or on kind of quick fixes or kind of pulling the data uh, in the sense of in the connection for, with L&D, it could be pulling the data of like how many learners have undertaken that course, how many credits do they have, um, how many hours have they spent on a specific platform. And I think that is really not giving us any, any information to which kind of people are actually learning, are actually applying it, are actually kind of um, having a good learning experience. And so I think it does serve for the, for it does serve for, um, for, for kind of L&D departments to have the information and to be putting people together to have a joint experience to share best practices. Um, but if we kind of just check the amount of, of hours someone spend on, on the platform or the amount of credits they have obtained, I think that is really a really tacked approach, so a really, really labeled approach to kind of just getting quick data and assuming that this is kind of getting it, giving us an answer on how, how good we're doing with our learning, uh, learning strategy. So if I summarize your approach, so it can just like summarize, like the first one is about like personalizing the learning experience to the individual. The second one is about selecting like the skills that is going to help the individual move forward. And this third one is about really selecting, uh, not being like so uh, like platform based uh, data, but also like pretty much like getting everyone together. So then like the application of knowledge is happens. Is that it? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so I think specifically the last one, it is, you know, like just the, the learning experience for me, it's all about kind of creating learning resources that help an individual in the moment they need it. So like I have my own challenges, I have my own tasks, and now I'm stuck. So where can I get the resources to get over that? Um, and then once I've learned that, how can I kind of share that with a group? How can I have people who are kind of maybe in similar uh, challenges and kind of creating those um, those those experiences. So for me, it's all around creating resources and experiences um, versus just courses and courses and courses. That's a very, very interesting. So you touched on that on this very, very briefly on, on your answer, uh, on your previous answer, but what kind of HR and L&D practices can help remove traditional labels and stereotypes in the workplace? Um, yeah, so in, in the book, I explore a specific antidote to, to labeling. Um, and two of the, the biggest antidotes are um, essentially uh, starting with the why. So like starting with the purpose. And I, as you mentioned, I already touched a bit upon, upon that topic. And so the idea here is really kind of before uh, looking into everything we do, whether that's learning, whether that's career progression, career pathing, um, whether that's rewards, um, it's all about kind of asking that individuals, like, why do you want to do it? Uh, so what is your purpose behind it? And I think we oftentimes assume that people, the only purpose people learn or the only, people, the only purpose people do something is a promotion or is a salary raise. And that is actually not true. There's like a lot of um, yeah, a lot of other purposes and a lot of other whys people kind of pursue. Um, and so very, very practically for, for that one, um, there is uh, an exercise in, it's, it's from a course called, called the Management 3.0 from Jürgen Appello, and he explores actually the motives for people to, to do stuff and to kind of, yeah, to, to learn, to advance, to, to why they do the, their, their job. And I think that is very, very practically a good example and a good exercise to kind of untag what a good untagged example, uh, something that managers can use really, really practically to kind of looking at the different whys, so which is relatedness, status, curiosity, acceptance, 
gold, power, freedom, honor, mastery, and order. Um, and so that is kind of really different, different whys, different motives of why, what people want to achieve and what they want to get out of work. And so if you explore that for the task at hand or for the job at hand, and if you explore kind of the connect, whether that is connected, act, act, connected actually to um, the objective that you want to achieve in a specific project, if you kind of really put those two pieces together, um, then I think skill building and learning is, is just a byproduct of that. So for me, it's really exploring the purpose, exploring the why, um, then giving autonomy towards how it's being achieved. And then through that kind of just assisting. So like whenever there's a blocker, how can I assist you? How can I give you the resources you need to advance in that specific skill versus kind of telling people these are the skills you need to learn for that specific task, which is again, pretty much top down and it doesn't touch just upon like personal motifs. So I think it's the first antidote really being starting, starting with the why and um, as a practical kind of example to be maybe playing around with these elements to just be vocal about it and just be be exploring different motives so what is what do i want and what is needed in that specific task right so maybe there's a specific task where there's really kind of no room for curiosity um and so it's just being vocal about it and so maybe that's kind of not what motivates me at this moment um but maybe um another person in the team kind of is more driven by uh, let's say um, order. So like having specific kind of rules to follow or a kind of, so I think that's really, really important to, um, to be vocal about that and to kind of put, put, put the purposes together as, as a starting point. Yeah. It's, it's really about tapping into, I'm not really sure if I'm you and use the right term here, but so correct me if I'm wrong, but it's really about tapping into the inner motivations of each, each person, right? So like, as you said, like we're starting like with the why, like why you, do you want to do this? I mean, of course, like there's, there's also like accelerate rays and, ex, and, and external things, but also there's a co- inner component that is, is still there. Exactly, exactly. And for some people, it might even be power or status. So maybe some people are motivated by having a different job title or some people are motivated by being higher up in the in the hierarchy just to have power and that's also good to know but not everyone is uh, and so i think traditional hr practices or so how i call them in the book tact on um, hr practices they assume that people just want to climb the corporate ladder just for the sake of sake of climbing it they kind of want to learn for the sake of learning and so i think there's always a different motif behind it and so like exploring that first um, is, is important. And then everything that follows, so like building the skills, building the connections that I need is, is actually a byproduct of on your journey of um, kind of why you, why you do what you do. And I think that is oftentimes, over, oftentimes overlooked in a lot of HR practices. Um, yeah, so that one being the first um, antidote. Um, and the second big, big antidote that I'm exploring in the book is the antidote of, of empathy. Um, and empathy, um, a lot of people actually don't know that empathy is something that you can train. And that is, you know, like, you probably have heard that empathy is one of the most important leadership um, traits. Um, but a lot of people are like, yeah, but I just naturally feel more empathy towards one person versus to another person. But empathy can actually be trained. And there's, it's all about kind of um, being more empathetic is all about kind of widening your in group So those people that are kind of within what you perceive are p- people that are similar as, as you. And so there's like a lot of exercises being done, for example, uh, around kind of if you see, um, there's a nice YouTube video, for example, if you see someone that is um, done harm to. So for example, in that example, there is a person really kind of with a needle stepping in the hand of someone. Um, and your brain reaction is um, actually more intense if that person is closer to you. So if you if you know or if you see that this person has the same gender, the same religion, the same skin skin color as you, then your empathy response is actually higher. Um, and so if you don't relate to that person, if that person is kind of completely different from 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 you, then you're more likely not to have the same amount of empathy. And what I'm what I'm exploring in the book is essentially that labels. So those kind of labels of senior, junior or um, being part of uh, team A versus team B, they actually contribute to lower empathy because we kind of have this feeling of them versus us, uh, this feeling of, oh, it's just the junior people or it's just the executive team. So I don't really kind of understand them. Um, And so it's kind of being really, really 
yeah, really um, conscious about about the fact that like with a lot of labels, a lot of job titles, um, creating different kind of benefits for different kind of uh, people or groups or uh, within the company can actually um, lead to to having lower empathy. Um, and so what I very, very practically would suggest here is really tapping into things as reverse mentoring, where you really have a chance to get mentored by, by someone that is outside of your of your company and group. So someone maybe from a different department, from a different continent, um, different different seniority level, um, as well as yeah, having cohort based um, learning experiences with com completely diverse groups, um, which I think is also something that is not very often done. So a lot of times it's, oh, we put all of the senior sales people in that group because they need to advance on skill X, Y, that, which obviously, yes, it, it also has, uh, has its logic, but sometimes that doesn't really contribute to creating uh, an environment of empathy and of understanding different groups and breaking the silos within within the company. Yeah, what I find interesting is that, uh, is it like the empathy? Because uh, actually that reminds, I, I don't remember the, the exact, the exact uh, statistic, but there was like a lot of people uh, in companies that were complaining about their, their line managers uh, or their leaders because actually they, they, they lacked like essential human skills. So pretty much like soft skills, like such as empathy, as you just mentioned, or uh, or like a more empathetic leadership, like well, that's what the term, I, I forgot the stats, but it, like the stats, it was, it was really, really high. Like lots of people are complaining about leaders who lack that, uh, that empathy to connect with them and really help them uh, move things forward. So it's really interesting that you touch on that as like this practice to remove the this traditional labels in, in, in the workplace. Yeah, maybe another another exercise that works very, very well is an exercise called the uh, the human library, where it's all about kind of it it fits very well in the in the metaphor of the book because it's all around kind of um not judging the book by its cover, which I think is something that we all do, that we see someone and we judge that person by by its cover. And so like the human library is just essentially being matched with random people in your company and just exploring what moves them and then also exploring that essentially the fears and the desires we have are so similar and there's actually more similarities than differences, even if it's a person in a different department, a different a different seniority level. And so that that itself also is, is a very, very powerful exercise to to broaden your in-group and to to be more empathetic. Yeah, the, the ripple effect that this, these kind of exercises must have on culture, on company culture, should just be really, really amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's it's something that really every company should be aspiring to do. Uh, okay, so you mentioned some exercises and some practices, HR and L&D practice that, that can help remove these traditional labels. Uh, can you share a concrete example of the implementation of these practices that you led in the past? Yeah, sure. Um, so in my, in my previous um, company, um, called Adevinta, which is uh, Europe's biggest um, online classified mark market provider. They, um, I was responsible for uh, the early careers program, and I really, really wanted to trial out something around being more purpose driven. Um, once they got into the company, um, so traditionally a lot of trainee programs or early pro career programs they have um, specific phases or specific rotations that you, for example, it's a two year program and people run through three different rotations. Um, but we kind of piloted something completely different, which was um, um, an early careers talent marketplace uh, based on the why. So like we essentially asked um, managers in the company who were willing to um, get an early careers as junior talent in their team to tell us kind of the challenges, the product project that they have um, currently open in their teams and to assign um, the motives to it. So like the, the motivators that I talked talked about yes, uh, just a second ago, um, the relatedness, status, curiosity, acceptance, power, freedom, honor, mastery, and order. And um, so they kind of put their projects to, yeah, it was just done in an Excel sheet. So they kind of just put all of the projects in there. They connected the skills that are that people would learn in those projects. And they would also with the option to kind of in a drop down to assign 
the motives that are mo most related to that project. So for example, if it was a project that was more around um, product development, maybe they kind of assigned um, the curiosity motive to it. Um, or if it was something that was kind of more required, more data analysis or kind of more following instructions, they kind of maybe assigned the, um, the, the, the order or the mastery element to it. And we did exactly the same on the other side, on the receiving end. So the early careers participants also had to kind of fill in a kind of a similar sheet um, just to kind of tell us what are their motives? What, what are they motivated by? Do they, are they kind of, is it curiosity? Is it relatedness? Is it status? Um, as well as the skills that they wanted to explore. And based on these two sets of data, we kind of merged people um, blindly. So it was not about, I want to work in the marketing department. It was more about what are the skills that you want to learn and what are the motives that, um, yeah, that what motivates you. And so we blindly matched, um, matched departments and early careers participants based on, based on that, um, which was a very, very uh, nice experience. And it was something that I've never seen before because usually people joining a big company, being in such an early careers program, they all want to kind of they pursue positions around strategy or marketing or something that sounds really, really fancy on CV um, without really being aware of the fact that maybe my motivation is kind of not even connected and, and I'm just pursuing that kind of shiny object, that kind of label that then looks good on my CV. And so people who kind of maybe had initial um, experience in the marketing field ended up in um, in a completely different department. So for example, in the, in the engineering, in the software engineering department, um, and they kind of learned something completely new, but that was still uh, in connection to to yeah to what motivated them and so that was um, a super super interesting exercise now, that's very very interesting this is the kind of program that i would love to have like in my early <laughs> in my early career okay so we're approaching the last uh question to, to of this podcast uh, this episode carolyn so what advice would you give to l d leaders who are looking to revamp their employee development programs one that is you know, that, that follows this untagged movement that you launched? I would really say it's uh, the connection between happiness, seeing the connection between happiness and learning and that in both directions. So um, when we're happy, we're more likely to learn in a sustainable way. So like if we really have a great um, environment, if we really are happy at home at work, and then it's also and it's also scientifically proven that the hormones of the dopamine and serotonin they actually lead to us learning in a kind of drawing the connections quicker, memorizing things quicker, um, really connecting quicker to the topics. So that is kind of really kind of my first uh, advice for people to 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 really see that connection. So like that happiness leads to learning. But also the other way around, that like and if you learn and learning in itself is is the biggest perk, and that a lot of studies have done done on that. So like, what do you want? What do you value in the workplace? And it's kind of not uh, the the football kicker or the, the 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 free fruit. It's really kind of being challenged, getting the chance to learn, and being getting having an environment where you can actually learn. Um, so it's also the other way around that kind of um, yeah, a learning um, is is kind of a uh, the best recipe for people to to be happy, and so I think if you as an L and D professional see that uh, to a, to a deeper level and you kind of provide that environment, and, and I think then um, people are unstoppable and they just kind of yeah acquire skills skills on the way. Yeah, it's really about like creating that. I mean, because I, I the only thing the word that comes to my mind when you say that it's well being. You know, people. You know, just well being at a company so people will be happier and they will like work like in a better way they will you know they will feel better at work and all that exactly no and also like the valuing i think we also speak a lot about valuing people and kind of engagement surveys but ultimately for me valuing someone essentially comes down to valuing that person with what they can bring to the table and valuing all of that people, that person's strength, and 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 helping that person to grow into 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 that, and tap into that, and I think that is that for me is all around valuing people, um, 
And so I think, yeah, I think really seeing that connection um, more deeply for me would be the biggest advice for for an L&D expert. Yeah, it's really about untagging those people, right? (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. And a certain, yeah, to a certain degree, yes, that's, that's it. And also something that another connection between learning and happiness for me is also the fact that it's not binary. It's not, are you happy? Yes or no. Or have you learned something? Yes or no. It is really kind of something that is building up on kind of, if maybe if I ask you, are you happier now than you were a year ago, maybe you could answer that question. Um, and the same goes, goes for learning. Um, it's not binary. It's maybe, it's not about black and white. It's also like seeing that it's something that kind of builds up on each other and that every day we kind of learn something small, whether whether we see that in that moment or not, but essentially with everything we do, we do with every interaction, we do learn something and just seeing it as, as a continuum rather than as, as a binary black and white. It's very interesting. Carolyn, thank you so much for your participation on our podcast. It was a real pleasure having you uh, with us today. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you again for the next episode of the Cross Knowledge Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues.